Good morning. It's 8.30 on Thursday, April 28th. I'm Desiree Frazier. This is Mississippi Edition on MPB Think Radio. On today's show, an in-depth look at Parchman prison failures, according to the Department of Justice. And why the state's new medical marijuana law may leave some would-be patients in limbo. This is Mississippi Edition on MPB Think Radio. We have a duty and an obligation to ensure those children growing up in foster care have the opportunity to turn their struggles into strengths. That's Governor Tate Reeves yesterday at the ceremonial signing of State House Bill 1313. The new law sets aside funding to help foster kids afford higher education. And Janella Lawyer of Jackson spent most of her childhood in Mississippi's foster care system. She speaks with MPB reporter Kobe Vance. I feel that it can open up many doors and also give youth that's in care or that have been in care uh, opportunities to get a secondary education and also um, just just showing them that it is an opportunity out there and it is funds that's available. So there wouldn't be too many excuses, so it opened up a lot of doors for them. Were you able to go to college? Yes, sir, I was. What was it like trying to get in and then trying to, you know, find funding for it? I had to take out a loan. So it was kind of, it was a difficult process because of when I, the worker that I had at the time, when I first entered into college, it was kind of hard to get certain documentations and also um, stay in school. So I had to like kind of run my worker down in a way to try to get the documentations for me to stay in school because basically the school was all I had at the time. So it was very important for me to get an education. Why was it important? Because I um, I tell you this younger than me all the time that um, they can take everything else from you, no matter you know what they take from you, they can take all the material things from you, but um, they can't never take you know what your knowledge away from you. So having a uh, education or something behind your name, they can never take that from you. So you can go to any state that you want and you can find a job because you have that degree. What opportunities do you think the door opens for you know for foster children in Mississippi to be able to get an education? Multiple opportunities, meaning like job opportunities, also just different career opportunities, branching out just to see the the different things that they will want in life and just showing them that it's a way out of the struggle as well. What would be your advice to people that are in the foster care system about, you know, trying to get their education and looking forward to their own futures? My advice would be right out of plan, right out of plan, um, also, I believe in prayer as well, so pray and ask God for guidance as well, but also surround yourself around people that mean you good, meaning like people that will motivate you. Also, be your own motivation. Don't wait on no one to give you anything, and also just having that education is very important because they can never take that away like I stated previously. And then lastly, as somebody who spent the majority of your life in foster care, what would be your words to people who are considering adoption of an older child? Nine years and older typically don't get adopted, and people might have concerns about adopting somebody in that age group. I would say that it's a lot of misconception around children that are older in foster care, and to get to know a child for yourself. Just understand that a lot of these children have been through a lot of um, either abuse, neglect, you know, trauma, different things like this. So just know that it is kind of difficult, maybe difficult at first, but each child deserves a home. And also just remembering that, you know, as an adult, you know, if you're considering adopting, that you will want a forever home. So it's important for our children to have a forever home. Although they may not be your biological child, you can still take them in and love them as your own child, just treating them right and just showing them um, care and love this important. That's Jackson resident Andronella Lawyer. Coming up, details from the Department of Justice's scathing new report on Parchment Prison. This is Mississippi Edition on MPB Think Radio. A contractor ever tell you the price of something and it sounds so high you think, eh, maybe I'll try it myself. Some jobs just aren't that difficult, and yes, you can do it. If you want to find out how to do those things, listen to Fix It 101, podcast everywhere.
This is Mississippi Edition on MPB Think Radio. I'm Desiree Frazier. The U.S. Department of Justice published a report last week outlining how the Mississippi Department of Corrections is violating prisoners' rights at Parchment. The report details how the Corrections Department is failing to protect them from violence. The Justice Department began its investigation into Parchment in February of 2020. That was after riots left some people who are incarcerated injured and dead. Here to discuss the report and its finding with us is the Gulf States Newsroom's criminal justice reporter, Brittany Brown. Brittany, how did the investigation start and what are the report's initial findings? In December 2019 and January 2020, fights, riots and fires broke out at prisons across the state, including at Parchman, causing prisoners to be killed and injured. As a result, all state prisons went on lockdown for a while. And for months leading up to the riots, there had been reports of unlivable conditions, gang violence, and staffing shortages at Parchman. In the midst of all of this, there had also been leadership changes and resignations among the heads of the Mississippi Department of Corrections. To give you an example of just how serious the violence was, it was reported that five people incarcerated at Parchman had been killed and three others died by suicide during the month of January 2020 alone. After this, the Department of Justice announced an investigation into four Mississippi prisons, including Parchman, just before the COVID-19 pandemic. Two years later, the report was published last week. The report is 59 pages long, and the Department of Justice outlines essentially four main issues that Mississippi Department of Corrections does not protect prisoners from violence caused by other prisoners. It also says that MDOC does not meet the serious mental health needs of prisoners and has too few qualified mental health staff on site at Parchman. It says that MDOC fails to identify and treat prisoners who are at risk of suicide. Lastly, the report states that MDOC regularly misuses and overuses solitary confinement, particularly with prisoners who have serious mental health and physical health needs. Overall, the Department of Justice says these issues are severe, systemic, and exacerbated by staffing and supervision deficiencies. The report does find that the Corrections Department violated prisoners' constitutional rights at Parchman Penitentiary. What are those rights, and how are they being violated? The report states that MDLC is violating prisoners' rights by misusing solitary confinement, not providing adequate health care and the staffing shortages that are exacerbating solitary confinement and other mistreatment outlined in the report. Specifically, the Eighth Amendment, that one forbids cruel and unusual punishment. And the Fourteenth Amendment, that one ensures due process. I see, I see. Well, is this issue of how inmates are being treated in Mississippi, is that new at all? No, it isn't. In fact, on Monday, I heard from a man incarcerated at Parchman who told me that these exact issues outlined in the report have been going on for the 20 plus years that he's been in prison. He said that he feels like MDOC doesn't care about them and that he's seen it all happen. Everything outlined in the Department of Justice report. I also spoke with Greta Martin, director of litigation at Disability Rights Mississippi. Her organization, like I just said, published a report last year that was very similar to this new Department of Justice report, citing inadequate medical and correctional staff and poor health care practices at Parchman and other prisons in Mississippi. Martin says advocates and lawyers have been sounding the alarm on poor conditions at Parchman for decades now. The things that the DOJ reported are issues that many of us that have been doing this work for quite some time, we've seen this for years. And these condition issues have been ongoing. It's really sad to say because, in my opinion, the state of Mississippi has been aware of these issues for quite some time. The report outlines other issues in Parchment, like prisoners extorting each other and their loved ones, contraband like cell phones, drugs, and weapons, some being brought in by MDLC staff, holding most of the prisoners in solitary confinement for over a year straight and more. Well, one thing that um, we have known, especially that came out during the riots in 2020, was that 
many, um, I, I guess it's just under 50 percent of the corrections officers at the time were female. And some of them felt threatened for their lives. So we heard in various reports and statements, Burl Kane, the commissioner, came on board to correct a lot of these things appointed by Governor Reeves. How is he responding to what DOJ is reporting at this point? Well, last week, MDOC told me that their legal team says they can't respond to questions about this report at this time. So we'll see. You know, like you said, uh, since Kane was appointed in May 2021, MDOC has made efforts to raise correctional officer pay in order to keep staff on the job. MDOC says it op- it reopened the Walnut Grove Correctional Facility last year to help prisoners recover from addiction and disaffiliate or leave their gangs. And the department has made strides to bolster reentry programs for prisoners. But how much of this is actively helping solve the issues outlined in the Department of Justice report? That's hard to say right now. Kane comes to Mississippi from the Louisiana State Penitentiary also known as Angola, where he was warden for over two decades. And Angola and Parchman have very similar issues, misuse of solitary confinement, so on and so forth. But Mississippi can also look to Alabama for some context here, too. In 2020, the Department of Justice also filed a lawsuit against the Alabama Department of Corrections after the DOJ alleged that ADOC failed to take action to resolve the issues outlined in a 2016 report about poor conditions at men's prisons in Alabama. So if Mississippi leaders don't take swift action, it's possible we could see a similar fate here. In fact, on the very last page of the report, the DOJ warns that it could file a lawsuit exactly 49 days after this report was published if state officials haven't addressed these issues to their satisfaction. Is there any indication at all that that might be the case? Again, I I think it's hard to say right now definitively, but, you know, 49 days is, to, to me, is not enough time to really fix all of these, what the DOJ called severe systemic issues, right? 49 days is just shy of two and a half months. That puts us at the beginning of June. That 49-day mark is at the beginning of June. We're already out of the legislative session. Um, so I think at this point, it's just kind of a we'll have to wait and see. So what kind of solutions does DOJ want for the department to come in compliance? The Department of Justice outlined a lot of ways that MDOC can try to solve some of these issues. There are nearly 10 pages alone that are dedicated to solutions. Some of those measures include changing how the prison approaches correctional officer staffing. The DOJ wants MDOC to screen, train, and hire COs and offer them competitive salaries and benefits. Put a policy in place that will prevent retaliation against prisoners for reporting CO misconduct. Implement a prisoner classification system that will protect prisoners from the risk of harm. Install more cameras to help with supervision and repair all broken security equipment. Conduct clearly documented cell inspections to remove contraband. Revise the mental health screening process to be done regularly and by trained staff provide timely and adequate medical care to prisoners. And there's so much more. The report provides a very detailed list of solutions to the issues outlined. So we'll just have to wait and see how MDOC and other state leaders respond. Greta Martin, Director of Litigation with Disability Rights Mississippi, says to fix parchment, it'll take collaboration from multiple people and organizations. But she's also not really sure if the prison can be fixed at this point. I think it's going to take an effort with both the medical vendor for the Department of Corrections to work hand in hand with the current administration of Commissioner Kane. And I think it's going to take some support from the Mississippi legislature. It's going to be a group effort. And I'll be perfectly frank. I don't know if a facility like Parchman 
is savable. But I, I truly believe Parchment is a seeking ship. I don't know if we're ever going to get that facility appropriately remedied for human residents. And this isn't the only one being investigated in the state, right? Right. The Department of Justice is also investigating three other prisons, Wilkinson County Correctional Facility in Woodville, Central Mississippi Correctional Facility in Pearl, and South Mississippi Correctional Institution in Leakesville. All three prisons are state-run, and CMCF in Pearl is the only prison in the state to house incarcerated women. The DOJ began investigating these prisons at the same time and did Parchman in February 2020. Those three other investigations are still ongoing and are focusing on whether MDOC protects prisoners from harm and provides adequate mental health care and medical care at these facilities. An ongoing issue, and we thank you so much for following this for us in your uh, diligent coverage of this. Brittany Brown with the Gulf States Newsroom, thank you so much. Thank you, Desiree. More Mississippi Edition ahead. You're listening to MPB Think Radio. This podcast is a local production of Mississippi Public Broadcasting and depends on the support of listeners like you. If you can, please donate today at mpbonline.org. And thanks. This is Mississippi Edition on MPB Think Radio. I'm Desiree Frazier. Columbia resident William Pittman supported legalizing medical marijuana at the outset when advocates began gathering signatures for Ballot Initiative 65 a couple of years ago. Pittman had borderline pers- has borderline personality disorder, a binge eating disorder, and ADHD. He believes legal cannabis could help alleviate some of its symptoms. But Initiative 65 never became law. Instead, the state legislature passed its own version of cannabis law, which limits eligibility to patients dealing with one or more specific diseases. Those include Parkinson's, Alzheimer's, HIV, AIDS, and ALS, which is Lou Gehrig's disease. That leaves people like William Pittman on the outside of the program looking in. Reporter Julie Whitehead recently profiled Pittman for the Mississippi Center for Investigative Reporting. He did take medication for quite some time. He had to be switched from uh, Vivance to Adderall because he switched insurances and his new insurance did not cover Vivance for adults. That's ADD medication. Uh, borderline personality is not a medicatable disorder, according to many professionals. So he is on medication, but some of his difficulties are difficult to treat. Tell us about the bill. Well, it discusses medical cannabis is what they're calling it, and it limits those people who can get take advantage of it to a list of X number of specific disorders, most of them physical. There are, There is a provision for PTSD, post-traumatic stress disorder, that people with that can submit to the program and will be able to buy medical cannabis. But that's the only medical, dis, the only mental disorder that's included on that list. What we are finding, it seems, is that there are a lot of people who believe that it can medicate mental disorders. There's a lot of studies on this, and they're very, they're very divided. Some of them are inconclusive. Some of them say there is a measurable effect, and some of them say there is no measurable effect. So there's a great deal of debate on this. So do you see this as a bill that's going to fall short? in meeting the needs of Mississippians who want to uh, be able to use medical marijuana? I do, mainly because it's not, there doesn't seem to be an allowance for people to petition to be included. That's my understanding, um, that people can't lobby that they're an exception to the disorders that are listed and that... um, it's a far cry from the original initiative, I'll just say that. And in what aspects? The initiative, as I understood it, reading it. Initiative was 65. The, right. Was that the doctor prescribing could make the decision 
that person was eligible for medical cannabis and that that would be taken on its face by the regulating bodies. And that is no longer the case. And Initiative 65 was a referendum that 74% of Mississippians voted yes for, but it was struck down by the Mississippi State Supreme Court. Saying the initiative process was flawed on its face. It was unconstitutional. Yes. Anything that I didn't ask you that's important to mention? A big question is how is this going to actually play out? The Department of Health is the one doing the regulating of the dispensaries and the uh, licensing mechanisms. Now, they are going to have to do a lot of coordination. And I think this is something that's not finished. And I think Mr. Pittman is simply a scratch on the surface for what we're going to see. Well, I appreciate you sharing his story with us and highlighting the new medical marijuana law that is going to be instituted in the state. Julie Whitehead, uh, who is a freelance reporter with the Mississippi Center for Investigative Reporting. We appreciate you speaking to us about this. Thank you very much. This has been Mississippi Edition on MPB Think Radio. Stick around for a full morning of Mississippi Radio. Coming up at 9, it's Creature Comforts. Then at 10, it's Autocorrect. And at 11, don't miss Southern Remedy. Find past installments of this and other Think Radio shows online at mpbonline.org. I'm Desiree Frazier. Join us tomorrow morning at 8.30 for the next Mississippi Edition only on MPB Think Radio. Have a good day.